Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Society for Promoting Chiropractic Education, I extend to you a very warm welcome to our first educational conference. We are delighted that so many of you from so many different countries have been able to join us today. For those further afield to the east and the west of us in the UK, I hope that the time difference was not too much of an inconvenience. I also trust that you and your families have been safe and well during this terrible pandemic. With the vaccine rollout having begun, I hope that we can all see light at the end of this tunnel. On behalf of the SPCE, I wish you all the very best of health. Our mission is to expand access to chiropractic care by increasing the number of chiropractors. This requires us to have more chiropractic programs. Following our efforts, we have now got two new chiropractic programs start in the UK during the last three years, and a third will open its doors to new students later on in the autumn. We have deliberately taken the path of locating new programs within existing health faculties of universities so that chiropractic students can benefit from multi-professional education and collaboration at an early stage of their careers. This is a major step forward and we are confident that this will help strengthen the profession in the UK. We also stand ready to assist in helping establish chiropractic programs in other parts of the world. During the pandemic, we launched our leadership interviews, which involved two of the UK's most senior chiropractic members, Peter Dixon and Matthew Bennett, discussing issues about the future of chiropractic education and the challenges and opportunities facing the profession. These, they were in conversation with key chiropractic leaders, academic and political from across the globe. We hope that you found these interesting. And if you have missed any, please go to our website or to our YouTube channel where these are all available. I'm sure you will enjoy these. The feedback that we got shows that these have been extremely well received and have been listened to and watched by a large audience, sometimes more than once. Today builds on that, and the theme of today's conference is chiropractic education reimagined. We have an impressive array of speakers who will share their views on different aspects of this topic. Our speakers are Dr. Adrian Wenban, principal of the Barcelona College of Chiropractic, Professor Leslie Haig, Vice Chancellor of AECC University College, and Dr. Giles Hazan, a family physician with a special interest in MSK. After their speeches, my colleague Peter Dixon will facilitate a question and answer session. So please send your questions to Peter and he will ask the panel the questions on your behalf. To do this, please click Q&A on your screen and post your question. Please restrict your questions to the presentations that you have heard. We are very grateful to our speakers for taking time from their extremely busy schedule and share their thoughts with us. Dr. Wenban, Professor Haig, and Dr. Hazan, thank you. We plan for this conference to be the first in a series of conferences on chiropractic education. I would also like to thank our sponsors whose support has enabled us to organize today. And these are Atlas Clinical, the British Chiropractic Association, the European Chiropractors Union, the McTimony Chiropractors Association, and the World Federation of Chiropractic. As you probably know, the SPCE is a not-for-profit organization funded by contributions from individual members of the profession, as well as by lay supporters. All those involved in running the organization give their time freely and no one received any remuneration for the endless hours that they devote to its work. I would therefore like to thank Matthew Bennett and Peter Dixon for their unstinting efforts on our behalf. Thanks are also due to our chair, Tim Lang, as well as our management board member, Graham Pope, formerly the chair of the GCC's education committee. Sumaya so Emmett has recently joined our team with the remit of increasing diversity and making the profession more inclusive. She has made a great start. So ladies and gentlemen, I now hand over to my colleague, Peter Dixon, who will introduce the first speaker. Over to you, Peter. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very delighted to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Adrian Wemban. Uh, I've known Adrian for many years um, and worked with him on a number of projects, most notably the WFC's worldwide consultation into the appropriate public identity of the chiropractic profession, which reported to the WFC Assembly in Sydney, Australia in 2005. Adrian presently serves as principal of the Barcelona College of Chiropractic. He holds qualifications in anatomy, chiropractic, clinical epidemiology, and medical education. He's been in practice for more than 30 years, and he's practiced in five different countries. He was associate governor of the Australian Spinal Research Foundation and was the inaugural president of the Fundación Privada Chiropractique. In addition, he currently serves as a member of the uh, Australian Spinal Research Foundation's advisory panel and is a member of the Cochrane Collaboration on Patient Reported Outcome Methods Group. He's been a member of the Spanish Chiropractic Association for 21 years and is currently enrolled in the last year of a Master's in Medical Education at the University of Dundee's School of Medicine. Uh, <coughs> Adrian will outline how the Barcelona College runs a bilingual programme in Spanish as well as in English. And he will also share his experience with distance learning and measuring learning outcomes. Uh, I've heard Adrian speak on. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very delighted to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Adrian Wemban. Uh, I've known Adrian for many years um, and worked with him on a number of projects, most notably the WFC's worldwide consultation into the appropriate public identity of the chiropractic profession, which reported to the WFC Assembly in Sydney, Australia in 2005. Adrian presently serves as principal of the Barcelona College of Chiropractic. He holds qualifications in anatomy, chiropractic, clinical epidemiology, and medical education. He's been in practice for more than 30 years, and he's practiced in five different countries. He was associate governor of the Australian Spinal Research Foundation and was the inaugural president of the Fundación Privada Chiropractique. In addition, he currently serves as a member of the uh, Australian Spinal Research Foundation's advisory panel and is a member of the Cochrane Collaboration on Patient Reported Outcome Methods Group. He's been a member of the Spanish Chiropractic Association for 21 years and is currently enrolled in the last year of a master's in medical education at the University of Dundee's School of Medicine. Uh, <clears throat> Adrian will outline how the Barcelona College runs a bilingual program in Spanish as well as in English, and he will also share his experience with distance learning and measuring learning outcomes. Uh, I've heard Adrian speak on a number of occasions, and I'm looking forward to learning more this morning. Thank you very much, Adrian. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Peter. So my presentation today takes a look at, I think what is for us as a healthcare profession, a, a, a real opportunity. It's an opportunity I think that's not been taken full advantage of. Uh, it's an opportunity that is increasingly discussed and sits at a very, very important uh, point in the schema of discussion within healthcare education. Uh, I, I think that we're at a point in our development as a profession that behoves us to move forward and to begin to carefully look at the conversation, the dialogue, the issues, the needs that are for, at the forefront of our um, context, if you like. The, landscape that we find ourselves in. And I think that we have a true opportunity today to begin to move forward at a number of levels in terms of the curriculum, in terms of the knowledge, the skills and the attitudes that we share, that we provide a context for developing amongst our, our students. The, the particular area of opportunity I think we had before us lies within what's referred to as cultural competence. Uh, I'll try to give you some frame of reference for why I think that is such an important topic today. Uh, 
and why I think we as a uh, developing profession who has, I think, great potential to serve the growing needs in this rapidly changing landscape we find ourselves in, um, why I think cultural competence is something that uh, we really need to enter into in terms of discussion, debate, and moving forward uh, within our curriculum, within our programs of study. This individual is not a chiropractor. Uh, he's not actually an educationalist either. He's actually in the past been referred to as one of the great futurists amongst us. Uh, his name is, his name was Alvin Toffler. Toffler was responsible for publishing uh, three books across the latter part of the 20th century, wherein he uh, described, uh, if you like, a cone of possibility going forward for us. Futurists are individuals or, or groups who um, take the time to reflect upon where we've come from, where we are, and where we're going in terms of major uh, demographic, um, in terms of major health and business industry um, trends that can shape and influence where we might be in another 10, 20, 50, 100 years. And so Toffler wrote a book called Future Shock. And that book was very, very well received. It was widely translated um, during the, the 1970s, early 1980s. And Future Shock had as its core um, finding that if there's anything we can say about the future, it is that we are going to experience change. And change taking place at an exponential rate. The amount of change that you and I have experienced in our lifetime compared to that of even just our grandparents is incredible. It's been suggested that the amount of change that we see in our lifetimes, up, at least up to this point, in a five to seven year period is greater than that that would have been experienced by our grandparents across their whole lifetimes. And so Toffler was very, very adamant that if we are preparing for anything, it is this accelerated rate of change. And that with um, the introduction of um, technology on the scale that we have before us now, that that rate of change is only going to accelerate further. Toffler delineated um, in his uh, third book called The Third Wave, um, a, a number of observations. He said that this book contends that the world has not swerved into lunacy and that beneath the clatter and jangle of seemingly senseless events, there lies a startling and potentially hopeful pattern. The third wave is for those who think the human story far from ending has only just begun. Um, it, it so happens that this particular report, which was crafted back and delivered to the profession back in January of 2005 by the Institute of Alternate Futures was developed by Ivan Toffler and his um, colleagues who had initiated the development of uh, an organization called the Institute for Alternate Futures. Um, Toffler was commissioned by the chiropractic profession to develop something that would allow us to consider where we are, where we've been, and where we might go. And uh, that was summarized in this report, uh, which related to 2005 to 2015. There have since been two additional um, versions of this document projecting forward to 220, 225. But the findings of his document, you can't read his recommendations there very well. And I'll read those to you. What he, what he recommended as a result of his review of our past, present, and likely future was that we accelerate research, that we uh, adopt higher practice standards, that we look towards greater integration into the, the healthcare, mainstream healthcare systems, that we be very careful in considering consumers' um, needs and wants, that we adopt consumer-directed care, that we look towards developing greater unity within our profession, that we look towards developing um, a presence, our skills, our knowledge, our resources related to public health prevention and wellness. And given the trends of an aging population, low fertility and the demands on, on our shrinking 
workforce in, in developed countries around the world that we also focus towards um, geriatrics and developing that area of specialty within the profession. I think Toffler's insights um, hit many marks, and I think that there are there's a lot there for us, both in that first rendition of his report and the subsequent two that are available to the profession. Uh, I, I think something that he didn't foresee and didn't comment about is um, the, the extent to which some things would stay the same and that uh, the, the kind of change that we're experiencing today the kind of context we find ourselves in with, a, with a, a, a context that's being, and the dialogue that's being driven, a conversation that's being driven by uh, a global pandemic, if you like, a, a situation that was discussed and talked about by futurists, uh, by, by journalists who were well-informed. Back in the 90s, a book called The Coming Plague, written by uh, a journalist, predicted that with the growing number of cities we have around the world, the um, amount of international travel that was made available very cost effectively for the middle class. A, a number of these variables were bringing to a head the likelihood that we would run into more challenges in terms of uh, contact and the spread of acute infectious diseases, which you know, and, and, until more recently, it would be suggested, I think, by the historians and sociologists, something that we, we had managed to largely gain control of. I think a, a number of political, uh, environmental, uh, developmental, sociological issues that are on our doorstep today have um, also driven uh, a move towards increasing boundaries and borders that we might not have expected. Back in 89, when the, uh, the Iron Curtain lifted and the Berlin Wall came down, I, I think that there was great hope and a move towards um, greater movement, greater um, international unity and a move towards uh, this idea of a global village where the barriers came down. Um, you know, even, even here in Europe, I think we saw that in 1999 with the development of the, as relates specifically to education, with the development of the Bologna Declaration, the Bologna Agreement signed by the member states of the, the European Union with a move towards creating a commonality, a, a, a common higher education space, if you like, for us member states of the EU. There was a move towards opening, if you like. Um, some of that was driven by, by financial and economic hopes and, and needs to improve the um, mobility of workforce and to decrease some of the redundancies and, and differences between the member states of the EU. But I think since 2001, since, since uh, early, the very, very dawn of, of this century, the 21st century, we've seen some barriers go up. And this graphic here, um, suggests that we now have um, a number of barriers. In fact, this is now a little dated. This is this this particular graphic our, of our walled world is from 2009. And if you update this, there are considerably more barriers between different uh, countries. This particular graphic suggests that what we would refer, refer to as the West has become the world's biggest gated community. Um, I think this is important for us. I think this provides context for my argument that going forward, um, our contribution as a profession will be greatly enhanced by us taking seriously this idea of providing an education that enhances our students' cultural competence, which I'll define for you shortly. If you take a look at this graphic, the, the, the areas in green, the countries in green that are within the wall, if you like, the barriered wall, uh, make up only 14% of the world's population. And yet people in that, in that, in that space uh, generate and have access to 73% of the world's income. That means 86% of the world sit outside that privileged um, gated community and they have to deal with living off 27% of the world's income. To give that a, a, a more real world number, it means that the people who live and exist who are uh, 
members of those different countries who are citizens of the countries within the walled community are on average generating and having access to resources that can be bought by $2,500 uh, dollars e equivalent monthly wage. And those outside, that is 86% of the world, are surviving on an average of only 150 US dollars a month. So a stark difference. I think this is important for us to, to take seriously and consider because if you map onto this map where our chiropractic educational institutions and programs are today, where do you think we sit? Well, I've done the exercise, not formally, but uh, I've, I have gone through and looked at this and more than 90% of chiropractic's educational institutions today that are accredited sit within that walled community. It means unless we do something radically different, the very vast majority of the world's population does not have access to our educational institutions, does not have access to the very, very important contribution that chiropractic does and can make going forward. I, I think we need to take this very, very seriously. I think it, there's an opportunity if we do. And that opportunity is born out of what we see happening in education today. And that is a shift. Uh, there is a shift being forced upon us to move towards becoming something very different uh, and, and a scale of difference in, in the classroom, in terms of curriculum development, in terms of the teaching uh, methods, the assessment methods, the alignment of our um, model of education, I think that, that we're on the doorstep of opportunity if we can step back and see where we're at and consider the opportunity that lies before us. The opportunity to start to provide care and education to the other 86% of the population that in large presently uh, don't have access to chiropractic education and education um, that's building practitioners who provide a model of care that can very much, I think, serve the growing needs of society on this planet today. Just to summarize, um, the West is the world's biggest gated community according to, to recent data. Currently 90% of the profession's accredited chiropractic programs are within this wealthy West's gated community. The range of people to whom chiropractic is currently accessible in the world is very, very narrow. Exporting chiropractic care and education to the rest of the world is going to take innovation on a multitude of levels. And I believe one of those levels relates to what's being referred to more and more within the dialogue taking place outside chiropractic, but within healthcare today, referred to as cultural competence. I'll just provide you with a, a, a slide that overviews where I'll try to go now in my remaining time. Um, I'll just quickly describe for you what is um, broadly the consensus on what constitutes cultural competence, why cultural competence is increasingly important, what are the innovative cultural competence opportunities for us as a profession, and what related innovation uh, in terms of cultural conference competence or aspects of cultural competence that we've already started to try to implement at the BCC. So cultural competence defined is that competence in relation to culture in healthcare describes the knowledge, ability and attitudes to provide care to patients with diverse values, beliefs and behaviors, including tailoring delivery to, to meet patients' social, cultural, and linguistic needs. Experts describe cultural competence both as a vehicle to increase access to quality care for all patient populations and as a business strategy to attract new patients and market share. I think those professions that start to take this seriously sooner than later will have a seat at the table and have a larger market share will carve out, if you like, a niche 
up amongst that other almost 90% of the population that today largely doesn't even know what chiropractic is, certainly doesn't have access to its educational facilities, nor in large practitioners who have been trained through accredited chiropractic institutions. Why is cultural competence increasingly important? Uh, we have increasing rates of immigration and emigration. The growing realization that social inequality is related to healthcare can indeed be increased by way of heightened cultural competence amongst care providers. If you go out into the, the literature, uh, th there's more and more conversation about inequality and limitations to access being in significant part um, supported by a lack of cultural competence amongst practitioners. And that comes back to us as the educators of those practitioners. I think that this is a place where we can really start to make a significant contribution to the inequality, the, the inequality in terms of access and even more broadly to social inequality. Providing people with access to care that's delivered by people, by trained practitioners who are competent culturally can make all the difference in the world to the quality of care that's delivered and to patient satisfaction and to patient reported outcomes. I think the other thing that makes cultural competence increasingly important, and I think is truly the window of opportunity that is opened and is the positive that comes out of the very, very challenging circumstances we find ourselves in today in the presence of these pandemic is the door that has been opened by way of online access to education. There are barriers to improving cultural competent care. Barriers among patients, providers in the European healthcare system in general that might affect quality and contribute to racial ethnic disparities in care include a lack of diversity in healthcare leadership and workforce, systems of care poorly designed to meet the needs of diverse patient populations, and poor communication between providers and patients of different racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds. If there's one level at which we have from day one of conceptualizing the development of the Barcelona College of Chiropractic taken this issue seriously, it's in relation to the linguistic component of cultural competence. And from the day of deciding to move forward with developing this institution, one of the bedrocks of developing it has been the development of a bilingual international college of chiropractic. We've attempted to establish and develop the first, the world's first bilingual program of study and institution um, for the chiropractic profession. That means we have two official languages, Spanish and English, and those two languages were chosen in part. Uh, it made sense given where we were geographically, given that we're in a, a Spanish speaking country. Um, it made sense in terms of us being able to appeal and provide access to the program to English speakers and Spanish speakers, the two most widely spoken languages on the planet. Uh, so Spanish, the second most widely spoken language. Um, it's the second most widely used language in research today. Um, and it's the third presently, and I, I, it's at this time when this was developed, which is 218, it was the third, I believe it's moving towards being second, um, most widely used language on the internet, although Chinese is, is certainly expanding very rapidly as well. The Spanish language um, is not something that's receding. In fact, it's, its presence is growing. As mentioned, it's the um, second most used language in scientific publications, third most used language on the internet presently. Um, many people studying at any one time and uh, deals with and relates to the base of 7% of the world's GDP. So combining those two languages, I think, provides a platform. It, it certainly doesn't answer the cultural competence equation in full, but it provides part of that equation. Uh, we see one of the benefits of developing a program that's built around this um, aspect of cultural competence in terms of where we get students applying. Although we only have 150 students at the college at this time, spread across the five years of the full-time program, 
we have students from 25 different countries. So it, it brings to play very, very broad appeal for students. When we survey our students, our graduates, um, a part of the appeal is that the program of study is based in the center of one of the most attractive cities for young people in the world, Barcelona, um, on the Mediterranean with, with very, very appealing cultural, historical cuisine combinations. It, it provides a very, very interesting place, but, but at the front and center is the opportunity also that if they're going to go and study chiropractic, they have the opportunity at the same time to become competent in a second language uh, to the point where upon graduation, um, our graduates are able to work in either a predominantly Spanish or English speaking environment. The foundation that that provides for improving the quality of care amongst a diverse range of patients is seen to be uh, very, very important and is spoken about increasingly within uh, health education circles as a, a solid foundation for jumping off and dealing with and approaching many of the other aspects of cultural competence. So as mentioned, we've developed an international college. It's the world's first bilingual college, two official languages, Spanish and English. I'll just quickly attempt to go through and give you some ideas about how we've um, integrated two languages into the program. And it doesn't just start and end with uh, providing students with uh, the curriculum in two languages. Um, it, it, it impacts what we do. It imp impacts our frame of reference as an institution very, very broadly. And I think in order to do this effectively, you need to take a, a multifaceted approach to the curriculum and its delivery and its team and look at uh, ensuring that you're, you're addressing and, and meeting many of the aspects needed to support students graduating with this important aspect of competence, cultural competence. In terms of admission, um, our admission criteria don't just include past academic performance. They don't just include, include one's computer skills, one's writing skills, um, one's communication skills, one's, um, it, it includes also their linguistic competence. So we make some evaluation of where uh, an applicant's language competence is, both in terms of English and in terms of Spanish. Um, interestingly, 51% of our, our students who start the program, neither English or Spanish is their mother tongue. So it makes it important that, uh, that these people coming in, studying and learning across this five year period, have, have a base of linguistic competence that allows them to have an optimal learning experience and that it provides the foundation for us to, as already mentioned, address and uh, enhance their competence culturally. Staffing. Uh, it, it presents many challenges for staffing. It, it reduces the pool of available staff members because we look for people who are bilingual and who have some multicultural experience. Uh, it, 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 teachers are provided with the opportunity to present in either of the two languages, English or Spanish. When they decide which to present in, we ask that they only present in the one, but in terms of answering questions, tutorials, PRAC components, clinical experience, the, the supervisors, the teachers, the staff need to have a level of competence in both languages that allows them to communicate with the broad uh, cross-section of students that are attracted to the program. In terms of curriculum, um, taking that, that base of linguistic competence in the two languages and then starting to reflect on chiropractic in society uh, is something we felt was important. And as a result, we built a stream of a modular stream across the five years referred to as chiropractic in society, reflecting on theory, on lo looking at principles, looking at different ideas within healthcare and not just providing them with a polarized, narrow chiropractic perspective. What does chiropractic's unique contribution to the healthcare arena mean and, and what are the strengths and weaknesses of that historically and in present day in terms of the research in relation to broader society's needs, wants um, and perspective. So that runs right across. It's a five ECTS module each year as is the case with, uh, with most 
programs within Bologna. Today, uh, our program is five years full-time, 300 ECTS, your European Credit Transfer System. And each year, five of the 60 ECTS that make up each year of the program is um, embedded within a module referred to as Chiropractic and Society 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 across the five years of the program. So it has an, a curricular impact. In terms of assessment, having a stepped uh, integration of students into the program and targeting each individual to work out what their level of competence is in terms of language and then targeting them in order to support and ensure that as they move through that program of study, they are meeting the linguistic requirements to ensure that once they get to the clinical modules, once they start to provide care under close supervision in our clinical facility, that they are able to converse in Spanish um, and that they're able to also write, read um, and, and speak in terms of uh, the local language, which is, which is Spanish. Um, when students apply, if they don't have the level linguistically, we can recommend or provide them with an offer of a place in the program, but require or recommend that they do our intensive um, summer program in language, which uh, precedes the start of the coming academic year. They complete that and provided their level is satisfactory, they're then green lighted to enter into the program of study. Even though we require them to have a level of competence um, in both English and Spanish. During the first year of the program, all lectures, which can be presented in either English or Spanish, are simultaneously translated. So that makes uh, that first year quite expensive for us in terms of running the program, but each class where needed is simultaneously translated. So in each of the the rooms that we use at the public university with whom we're affiliated, the University of Pompeii Fabra, we have a soundproof booth set up in the back of the room. Um, students enter the room, they pick up a headset, it's tuned to the two professional translators who are in the soundproof booth in the back of the room who are translating either into Spanish, if the presenter is presenting in English, or into Spanish, uh, the other, if the, into English, if the presenter is speaking in Spanish. And so students during that first year, if they do have any problems in terms of comprehension, have the opportunity, the option to hear in, uh, in real-time translation, the, the, the presentation being made by uh, lecturers in both, both Spanish and English. Um, we have certain points at the end of the first year, students need to show that they have um, develop their linguistic capacity to the, to the level necessary. Again, as they go to enter into the clinical realm, which happens in the third end of the third year of the program of study, um, they have to sit in OSCE and uh, they also need to show us that they have the linguistic capacity to start to work in the clinical environment, um, utilizing Spanish as the, uh, the method of communication and that they're able to write their notes in Spanish as well, which is required by, by law here in Spain. Our teaching methods um, uh, already mentioned the simultaneous translation. I'll take you through just briefly um, each of these different elements. I've already discussed them. Uh, language evaluation, as mentioned, something that uh, is important at the front end of the program. We do that by way of having interviews. Each student who applies to enter the college is interviewed by myself, by our admissions coordinator, and by our head of research in order to assess their academic record to that point, their uh, motivation for coming to Barcelona and being uh, schooled in chiropractic, and also, as mentioned, to evaluate their linguistic capacity. In bringing staff to the team, uh, very, very important for us to ensure that our staff have the requisite uh, communicative skills and that they're fully aware of just how important uh, enhancing the content of their program, despite whether they're teaching basic sciences or clinical sciences, that students are considered in terms of who they are, their values, their beliefs, their religion, their linguistic capacities and weaknesses, and that that's brought into the conversation and considered and developed as we move through the, the respective modules and they develop their uh, cultural competence as we move through the program. Chiropractic Society already mentioned that to you. Um, again, that uh, we are very, very keen to ensure that students aren't just given material from a, stay, a sage on the stage, 
the old didactic model. Again, I think part of the opportunity we have moving now towards much of the theoretical component of our program of study being delivered by Zoom, um, that we become very, very innovative and creative in terms of how we communicate this material, um, presenting students with material prior to the class, um, having it student-driven, student-led, and instead of, as mentioned, having a sage on the stage, having a facilitator on the side in conversation and discussion that's increasingly student-led as we move across the program of study. Assessment, uh, a stepped language progression model in place, just as students need to know, need to be assessed and show that they're improving in terms of their um, other competencies. And we are um, an institution that has developed our own set of competencies built out of the CAN meds competencies. Uh, we have seven main competencies and uh, of course cultural, although not one of those main competency areas overlaps with collaboration, overlaps with professionalism, overlaps with um, management and communication, which uh, are some of our other leading competencies. Teaching methods, I already mentioned to you the uh, importance of the simultaneous translation. This is a picture of a classroom. I mentioned that in the back of the classrooms, we have two professional translators in a soundproof booth. They take turns to translate um, for example, in this class, me presenting something up at the front there in English, um, a number of the students have headsets on listening to the two translators translating exactly what I say um, into Spanish. Uh, and that takes place during the first year until students have the level of competence in terms of their comprehension of the two languages to be able to deal with the English Spanish provision of class. We also, during the first couple of years, provide the lectures. Um, most of the lectures are provided on our virtual learning environment in both languages. So students have access to the PowerPoint and other related um, supportive material in, in the written format on the virtual learn, uh, learning environment in both languages. 90% of our institutions sit within this gated community. We, we have to get beyond, I believe, some of the arguments and conversations that have, have divided us and that have led us to be circling the wagons and shooting inwards. I think uh, a lot of us at these tables within the profession um, at times get a little frustrated with the extent to which what, be sh what should be in-house discussions, arguments, and uh, justifiable debates amongst ourselves spill over, divide us, and interfere with our um, ability, our limited resources in, in dealing with what is the challenge, and that's outside that circled wagon chain. <laughs> We need to get beyond shooting inwards at one another and start to um, put those conversations and debates where they belong in house. It's not wrong for us to have our disagreements, but it's certainly wrong for us to allow our, our disagreements to divide us, to detract from the very limited resources that we have as a profession to take chiropractic to the 90% of people who sit outside the realm in which we presently provide our very, very limited uh, resources in terms of educational institutions and our graduates. I feel like at the moment, we're not even shooting inwards. Uh, with, with what we've been hit with in the last 12 months, it, it feels like at a, at a professional, at a global level, our profession has been so busy in survival mode, we're just circling wagons. We're not shooting anywhere. <laughs> and I think that, you know, we need to, to find our feet. I think um, my, my argument, my topic of interest here, the idea of uh, cultural competence providing us with a very, very important topical opportunity to shift our curriculum, to, to explore taking our institutions to the other 90% of the world that sits outside our gated community I think that that's just one example of many, many competencies and opportunities that are surfacing as a result of the challenge that's forcing us to look at ourselves, um, not just us as chiropractors, not just us as a profession, us as a species, 
on how we interact with our environment and with other sentient beings on this planet, I think the opportunity is for us to show leadership and to start to look at how we can be part of the solution as opposed to part of the problem. I think the, the management board of SPCE, of the Society for Promoting Chiropractic Education for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's a real privilege an opportunity for me to share with you some of what we've been working so hard on in Barcelona for the last 10 or 12 years. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share and uh, thank you for the very, very important work that, that you uh, are doing in terms of advancing chiropractic uh, within the UK, within Europe and the rest of the world. Okay. Are we? Okay, can, can we um, go off screen share, please? Yeah, oh, that's better. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Adrian. That is a most enlightening presentation. And I'm sure that people would want to pick up aspects of that and, 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 and discuss with you when we come to the Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, now I turn to the next speaker and it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Leslie Haig, Vice Chancellor of AECC University College based in Bournemouth. She is a physiotherapist by profession and has had an extensive career spanning over 25 years as a senior academic leader, researcher and clinician in several UK universities. I first met her when we established a Society for Promoting Chiropractic Education. She was the Dean of Health Sciences at London South Park University and we approached her given that she was a physiotherapist with some nervousness and trepidation about starting a chiropractic program. We could not have been more wrong. Professor Haig was disarmingly welcoming, open-minded, and from the word go, worked with us on the basis of how, not why, LSBU should develop a chiropractic program. For starting us on our way to extending the provision of chiropractic programs in the UK, we are most grateful to her. Professor Haig has an extensive and highly successful track record of developing new academic provision in the UK, including chiropractic, and building successful partnerships with universities, healthcare providers, and research organizations in Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and North America. She is a passionate advocate for person-centered and multi-professional education and care. In her talk today, she will present the clear advantages to chiropractic education being situated in university settings, both in the UK and internationally, and the impact this may have on the chiropractic profession. She will, however, also outline challenges which persist in higher education settings and their development, putting forward solutions for overcoming these. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand between you and a most interesting talk so without further ado, I give you the most excellent Professor Leslie Haig. Over to you, Professor Haig. Oh, that's so kind of you, Satchit. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, I'd just like to expend, extend my uh, huge thanks, obviously, to Satchit, Matthew and Peter, who I wouldn't be here without the discussions that we've had and indeed the interactions and their unstinting dedication to taking chiropractic educationally to the next level, I think really will transform what we can do across the UK and, and beyond. So a uh, huge thank you to all of you. I, I'd just like at this point actually to, to congratulate all of the staff and students in HE um, for the, all of their efforts and indeed colleagues across practice, um, you know, who've been through a really tumultuous year and uh, coped incredibly well. So um, just massive thank you, you know, especially to the guys back at ACC who are still going as we speak. Um, 
Thank you. Thanks also to um, obviously fellow speakers, and I'm sure Giles will pick up more on some of the advanced practice and some of the professional uh, roles later on. I was obviously really interested to hear the, the talk from Adrian uh, a second ago on, on cultural competence, and some of the areas I'm going to talk about is probably more looking at systems competence, actually, within, within context as much as broader cultural competence within populations. So um, I will just share my screen and get going. Yeah. All right, can everyone see that? Just a quick nod from someone of the panel. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, so I've looked at this really in a, in a few ways of new territories, as in how we take chiropractic elsewhere, but also actually how we develop chiropractic within existing um, agendas and, and, as you say, sort of uh, systems, as it were. Um, I'm going to look at this in three main areas. So I guess context and drivers, so globally in the UK, um, as Satchit mentioned, why, why is it so important that chiropractic education is, is driven from university settings? And I, I don't actually think it's just important for university settings, but specific types of university setting probably are, are really important, which they've alluded to in terms of where they try to focus the developments going forward. Um, and then there are ongoing challenges, I think, but I'm going to be try and be quite pragmatic about it. So the sorts of strategic challenges that, that university leaders face, which we see all of the time, uh, and also that the educators face, trying to take things to a new level when perhaps they've not experienced that themselves. It's quite, quite, a, quite a big ask, I think, of, of a lot of our colleagues. So the context and, context and drivers, well, actually, if we'd been sitting here 18 months ago, it might have felt quite different, but there's, there are clear contexts that have developed in the last year. So I'm just going to run through some of these. I, I think, you know, overwhelmingly within all of this, my, my sort of clear case I want to make is that I don't think there is a really question as to why the chiropractic is helpful, useful, essential. I, th I think the case for the global burden of MSK and back pain actually speaks for itself. I think it's more about how we unlock that rather than wh whether it's whether it's a, a helpful, useful or essential profession. And hopefully some of this will, will help to drive that. Um, the WHO is obviously before COVID hit, that's new strategy out which is really about um, health equalities, population health. So that's something, again, that feeds into all of our work across. Post-pandemic, that's become even stronger. So health inequality has got worse in the UK post-pandemic, and we're all in that boat. There's, there's clear guidance to, to the integrated care systems that health inequalities is one of the top priorities. So whether that's health foundation funding, whatever. So that's, that's everybody's business. Um, there's a clear driver on population health. Um, it's, no, it's not news to any of you, I'm sure, on the call that, of course, uh, the impact of musculoskeletal disorders in terms of global burden across most areas, and specific, specifically low back pain, is, is one of the number one causes of you know, disability adjusted life years. So what we're talking about largely here, of course, is things that affect quality of life rather than longevity, but quality of life, the ability of individuals to work, to earn an income, to be occupationally active in the broadest sense, um, the impact on local uh, economies, so local enterprise partnerships, really interested in getting people back into work. How can we improve the economy within areas? Well, you need a, you need a stable, healthy workforce. So as I think a lot of people have said throughout the pandemic, in order for um, societies to recover, we need to be healthy and well. And I think, you know, chiropractors uh, play a huge role in that. Uh, the latest studies on rehabilitation that one in three people globally will need rehabilitation at some point so there's a clear driver and that's in its broadest sense as well but clearly given the, the musculoskeletal side of that we, we have to ensure that as we produce practitioners that they are good diagnostically they're good at some certain interventions but they certainly have got an eye for what rehabilitation looks like across the piece we've got to get people back into, into work and into being uh, economically active if you like um, profession specific, just to, I guess I'm just I've just sort of picked some of the key key aspects really. So this is the uh, WFC definition of chiropractic um, and the sort of B epics. So this has come through from European Chiropractors Union and the WFC around evidence based, people centered, interprofessional, collaborative. I guess I, if I'm being uh, 
a bit picky. I guess if you're people centered, you'd be treating people, not disorders of the musculoskeletal system. Um, so it might might be something as we you know look at the profession and how it uh, describes itself and its activities. I think that there is something about the words matter. And in, in a system which is looking increasingly at personalized care and shared decision making and the voice of the of the patient and the individual service users. Um, those those sort of subtleties, I think, can make a big difference in the presentation of, of what we're all trying to do. Um, I think, again, many of you on the call um, that will be aware of the real difficulties that some of our colleagues have in other parts of the world. Um, and I think. Um, this is this is from 2020. I know that things are being updated all of the time, thankfully. But you know, we, we still have challenges in the UK. But but obviously, compared to some of our colleagues, that they have really really stark challenges in some of the areas. So, uh, Adrian's absolutely right that we need to be aware of those cultural competencies. But I think if we can point to certain countries as best practice that to help drive that as well, and how systems might develop, it's actually really important. Um, even in my own field, physiotherapy, it's as, as a such a difference between where we're at in the UK, where colleagues are at in Asia, where colleagues are at across Europe, um, which is still very medically driven. So, so there are things that, that, are, that are changing. And, and obviously, we're supportive of that. I'm working very closely with colleagues in, in Holland at the moment to try and develop some of their in-country programmes and how they might make their strategic and, and financial arguments to, to their funders and to their universities. Um, they had obviously, I'm sure many of you are aware that in the local pandemic, whereas in the UK, things were able to be opened up for UK chiropractors after the first wave in, in Holland, they really struggled to get a voice and to be seen as essential services. Um, still huge issues, and I've just drawn out a, a, a sort of an example there of, of Austria, where chiropractic is obviously very low number. So, so size does matter. So numbers in a country, I think, of chiropractors obviously do make a difference, which is what colleagues here are really trying to take forward. So that's, that's you know, fantastic. Um, but culturally, to some extent, I would argue that until some of these legal barriers are lifted, it's very hard for, for chiropractic in other countries to progress. Um, and a lot of that, I think, can be driven through the education environment. Um, that's probably because I'm a bit biased, but um, clearly that you know we they can trail we can trailblaze for everybody else, so that's that's helpful. Um, some aspects here, which I guess I say I won't I won't go into to Giles's territory too much because I'm sure he'll be covering some of this in his uh, with his MSK focus in care. But but there are clear contexts um, and lots of focus on MSK for for obvious reasons. We just said there's a global issue. There's a huge huge UK issue, which again has worsened. Um, in the pandemic, we're all aware, I'm sure, in our local areas of the orthopaedic waiting lists at the moment, which are not looking good. Um, we're doing our bit for waiting list initiatives locally uh, in terms of imaging because there's such a, a backlog. Um, the long term plans in place. There's new announcements that, again, are, are sort of not new to the system, but have been made much more public that integrated care systems had to uh, change their structure and sort of streamline slightly in terms of clinical commissioning groups. Um, by April 1st this year. And there's all sorts of alignments in that, but huge opportunities. Um, we're now looking at regions in the country where the remit is for the regions to look at their population health and look at all of the providers within that area, where it doesn't, you know, it could be volunteer providers, local authorities, uh, mainstream health, uh, private providers potentially to look out for their population health. So, so they've really been empowered. I guess this is a, another sort of decentralization in a way, but, but it's very much looking at working across regions again. But huge opportunities if for those people in that system to work together for the benefit of their populations. And that's the clear remit. Um, other things that are going on, as we know, first contact practitioner, this is the um, this is a commitment that by 2024, all adults in England will be able to see an MSK first contact, well, physiotherapist uh, in, that, in this particular, um, interestingly, in this particular publication at their local GP practice without being referred. Um, Royal College of Chiropractors and uh, the Osteopathic Foundation have both Done, produce publications on this sort of basic time sort of saying that actually there's really key case studies but there's also some work that's gone on about looking at the equivalence of what chiros and osteos can offer within this space um short short of mapping across and i think there's lots of careful mapping that's been done uh, perhaps a bit more of a sort of generalist 
um, approach to healthcare more widely that, that probably isn't, hasn't been delivered in chiropractic education establishments, clearly they would be, you know, both, both professions would be incredibly capable. And again, you know, I don't want to, to, to drift into other things that might be said later on. Um, but there's a huge need that the FCP approach is taking practitioners away from acute care. So that's hence the need to produce more and more allied health professionals because they're actually being taken out into the community. When you're sitting there with osteopaths and chiros, already <laughs> highly qualified professionals, potentially that could support this move. So and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. And um, obviously moves into advanced practice, which again are taking people up to a different level. So there's a whole, this whole area of work that, that is currently being expanded. Um, and I think we, 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 I'm sure we all agree that os osteos and, and chiros can both fill that gap quite readily. Um, again, massive things going on at the moment. There's a huge MSK personalized care agenda. Um, long COVID, we're setting up a long COVID rehab center on site to support the local NHS. Um, population health, dementia, mental health. So whether we're working in musculoskeletal or not, these are areas that our students need to be aware of. These will touch the patients that they have, they will touch their families, they will touch their systems. So when it's sort of say looking at MSK systems, well, the MSK system, that's why, you know, this is about individuals with broad remits and broad needs. So we're, you know, as much as possible, we're looking to see how we can change the language to be culturally competent within our healthcare system for our students so that they have the exposure and the knowledge of the relevant side of mainstream health because their patients will be, be <laughs> coming from all of that. Um, and I guess that's one of the key challenges that, that we've got is to sort of give that exposure to the students within our setting. And I'll come back to that and, and how, how universities can make sure that that happens. So really the sort of why, how and what, I guess, I guess of, of university-based chiropractic education. So why is it so important to have Cairo education in universities. Um, I actually think it's really important for the profession. So there's something about enhancing the role, status and identity of chiropractic. Um, I do think it's important that we establish whether, again, for reasons I'll come to shortly, whether chiropractic is a complementary and alternative medicine or a subject allied to medicine. Um, it really, really matters what we, what we call it publicly and what we can consider it is. Other people have lots of ideas about what it is, but it's actually really important. I think there's an agreement across the profession of what it is or what it needs to be or should be and where it wants to be categorised. Um, what we can do in universities is actually focus on spinal care and MSK expertise, but we can introduce different contexts. So whether people end up working in the NHS or private practice, which a large majority of, of actually um, MSK physios end up working in private practice, we can provide the context to make sure that the students have the exposure to various contexts through their training. And again, in much more multi-professional faculties, that's much more possible more quickly. So they can see some, through shared learning and professional learning. Um, the understanding of patient-centered care is, is absolutely critical. So I was saying, so this sort of personalized shared decision-making, it's not patient satisfaction, but it's actually, it is about patient-centeredness. Um, and I think there needs to be a really strong understanding of that, which, again, we need to really embed within the students as they come through. The sense that what we're talking about really is a, is a primary contact profession rather than a prim primary care. We know we're not producing medics. We are producing really fantastic primary contact practitioners that can work in an independent setting. And, and ultimately, um, and Adrian obviously mentioned it, there's, there's plenty of discussion and debate. HE clearly is a, is a perfect area and arena to hold those discussions around the philosophy of the profession and, and where it's going. Um, we can, I think, also help to really make sure that as students are and that the profession is, 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 is you know, taught and graduate, graduates out, is that the curriculum is relevant. And it's relevant not just to MSK and spinal care, it's relevant to the multi-professional frameworks. As, you know, I'd, I'd see little point in, in chiropractic producing its own documentation of how, you know, the chiropractic guidelines for everything, when actually there are mainstream guidelines which actually are already evidence-based. So unless there's something massively different that chiropractors are doing, we, we, must, we must make sure that whatever the what we're doing in the chiropractic profession 
is that we are mapping it across to other frameworks. Because without that, people just don't aren't going to see the relevance or the of the professional uh, contribution. Um, I'd say the country, cultural competence is, is therefore about the language of, of healthcare. Whatever people choose to do when they graduate is, is absolutely fine and they'll choose to do all sorts of things. But we've got to demonstrate that, that it does fit the capability frameworks that are already in place without having to re, really to reinvent the wheel. It's already there. We know what we need. We know where, where we need people to work. We know what we need them to do. We have shared, shared evidence bases that absolutely demonstrate that the chiropractic skill set you know, is effective, um, does produce change, does reduce pain, does improve quality of life. Um, I, again, I don't think there's any, there's any, you know, we're not trying to prove the, the, the value of chiropractic, but we are trying to improve the relevance of it and the acceptability and the accessibility of it to others, mostly. Um, no doubt that obviously we need universities because actually we've got to have the qualifications that mean that, that it's a transferable within country and across countries. Um, we need more research, we've said that already, with a very private practice based professional. Research and research and development does not, is not widely taken up. Because actually you've got your qualification, you can go and practice. Why do I need a PhD? So, we're, so I think, again, with more university settings coming through, we've got opportunities to, to drive more research, and that's really important. Graduate attitudes, behaviours and expectations. And then I said that, you know, the opportunities for interprofessional and shared learning. And I think it's not a nice to have. I think it's a must have in the university setting. Um, if we don't provide it there, it's really hard for people to get those opportunities really when they get into practice. They have to then go out and do the, you know, do their own networking, develop their own language, develop the systems knowledge. And we, ha we have to give that to students as they go through. Um, just a few examples, I suppose, in terms of, you know, as how we are raising expectations. This is the, from the GCC educational standards, which obviously we have to map to. Um, so these things are all written in. So build an interdisciplinary approach. Um, that's there so we must do that how we do it I think is really important um, int again integrated across academic and clinical settings it's not clear about which ones but I would argue that we need to be quite brave and uh, aspirational about the different settings that we put chiros into that, that we that the context that we provide and that works two ways obviously it exposes the chiros Cairo students to those settings, but clearly it also exposes everybody else to these fantastic Cairo students that we are producing who are highly intelligent and highly capable. Um, so we've got, we've, they are our best, they're our best marketing tool. So let's get them out there. Um, and interprofessional education. This is the, uh, again, this is the GC standards that, um, that we are, you know, we provide the ability to integrate and apply knowledge and skills, but it then suggests it could include placements. Um, Another, and I would say it must include placements. Again, within this sort of interprofessional setting, we, we've got to provide those elements for people. We know that if you're trying to develop interprofessional education, the best place to do it is in practice, not in the classroom, but actually out in practice and people can actually work with others. Um, for those reasons, I won't go through all of that in the time that I've got, but you know, it's, it's irrefutable, the, adv the advantages of interprofessional education in terms of the development of not just the individuals, professional identity, but their awareness within the system. And obviously better for the patient. Um, journey to approval. Again, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but just I suppose that the awareness really of, you know, this is a lot of work. So um, I met Peter and Satchit and, and Matthew in that round of, you know, starting to work up the development, it takes up to school level, goes up to university executive, then it comes back down. You're talking to the professional bodies, professional stakeholders, you're looking at the internal climate, external conditions, patient service user voice within that. Um, it's hard work. You know, there's a lot to do. Uh, curriculum design and approval takes about 18 months. So a huge amount of work. So you know, these are very persuasive gentlemen that you were dealing with um, that are sort of sitting there working with the faculties. There's, there's a lot that we are needing people to do to take this on in their, in, in their institution. So there's got to be some real advantages in that. Um, oh, and the paperwork, I should have mentioned that. So, so there's lots of, lots of upfront investment. Um, so how do we make sure that chiropractic continues to adapt and thrive in this environment, um, that it's not seen as a sort of alternative medicine you know, profession. 
um, for those that perhaps are prepared to pay for it or whatever. And I think this is the this is some of the biggest challenges that we've got. Um, so I'm going to run through a few of these. I haven't got the, all the answers, but I've got some observations perhaps. Um, one of the things that we that is obviously an ongoing thing is about reputational risk. So you know, if I'm a university leader, which I am, and we're going to, to other universities, um, this is the one thing that they'll look at. But the biggest challenge we have at the moment is that the higher education subject code associated with the chiropractic puts it into a complementary medicines and therapies group uh, just, uh, just below beauty therapy, um, which isn't the best place to be. And that's something I think as, as a group of universities, we can support the profession, we can challenge this, we have the know-how, we're seeing this, this is our system, we're working with this. But actually, if we want to, to um, chiropractic to continue to get high cost for education funding, that's not the best place for it to sit. And when HE is starting to try and reduce the costs associated with, you know, with, with people taking degrees in the UK dramatically, you've seen all of the rhetoric from the government, um, there's something we need to be incredibly vigilant of. So that's something now, that's a, a, an absolute commitment I'm, I want to make today to try and support that move uh, with, the, with professional colleagues to try and challenge the situation of that coding. That, that's, a, that's a, you know, it's a big sort of a, a, a big, red, big red flag. Um, the, the definitions that are out there. So if I go onto the NHS website, uh, chiropractic is a treatment where a practitioner called a chiropractor uses their hands to relieve problems with the bones, muscles and joints. So it doesn't work, again, words matter, it doesn't work with people to support them to improve or to reduce pain or to, they're very basic, is considered complementary and alternative medicine, which means it's not a conventional medical treatment. So that's what I get when I go onto the NHS England website. Uh, and that's that's what I get when I sort of next to it around the complementary and alternative. So includes acupuncture, homeopathy, aromatherapy, meditation and colonic irrigation. So this, again, is about how can we make sure that we represent the profession as a group? And actually, as we grow the number, especially in the UK and internationally, as we grow the number of educational institutions, I think we can start to really challenge this as a broader group. Um, we're producing really high qualified, highly qualified graduates. These are not in a complementary setting when they're working with other healthcare professionals on the way through, and there's evidence of them working in NHS settings during their training. That's not not appropriate. So, so this I say lots, lots, lots to take forward. I think lots that we can make a big difference on. Um, statutory regulation, of course, it's absolutely critical. And again, that's from from our some of our colleagues overseas. That's of course a, a huge hugely difficult situation that they're in, that they're not regulated or legally regulated, but it's, it's massively important that that's the case. Uh, we do have problem with social media. Um, as, uh, you know, Adrian mentioned that before. We also, <laughs> we all know Blue Woad um, and other things that come up in social media. And I guess it's actually how, as, as a, a group of professional supporters, we, we deal with those things. A combined approach would be obviously really helpful. Um, we actually brought in someone recently who's a sort of, you know, a comms crisis person to advise on, on, how, on how we might deal with some of the things that come through. Do we get involved? Do we not? Do we step away? Do we work that through? Um, there is a stigma when we're talking to some colleagues in NHS. I don't know if Giles has felt that and, and others around. Actually, I'm, I correct people who I think should be our allies in that, in that arena, who I need them to be publicly <laughs> declaring it to be, to be an ally. Um, and we need to know who those allies are and we need to, to work with them very closely. Um, the title of doctor came up recently as being something that was very unpopular with the, the, the um, public from the GCC recently. Again, that's something that that is something that, that other people will look at in other professions. The more that's integrated, it's just being very aware, I think, of, of some of the, um, the ways that the, some of the, the titling might get used. Um, the the um, allied health status is something obviously that, and I, again, I'm sure Giles has come across, they may well be working with osteopaths within an NH NHS setting. They've managed to sort of get, um, although they're incredibly equivalent, but they have obviously managed to get this HP sort of status, which means they're sort of recognised as an allied health professional in the UK. Um, the Is that a huge issue? Possibly not. The, the, only, the only kind of massive advantage, though, I would say, is that when we're looking at expanding numbers and expanding courses, 
uh, they suddenly have the weight of the NHS careers department behind them, uh, promoting osteopathy as, an, as a career and where you might go and train. So there's now what, 10, 10 providers of osteopathy education, I think in the UK. So that's growing too. So I think it's just a case of that, you know, that, that would be very helpful to, 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 to look at that status again on, and obviously move as much as we can. And again, I think universities are also working with other professional groups, whether it's doesn't have to be an HP, but it's it's getting some element of NHS recognition, I think, more formally. However, that happens is something I think universities can really support because we're working with all of lots of lots of other professional bodies. So you know, I don't think, the, you know, to support the, the profession and all of the hard work that's going on um, all of the time on that. Um, financial, well, I remember um, my colleagues here coming uh, armed with a very useful um, spreadsheet of, of sort of financial plans, which was really, really important. Um, in the end, um, where if, if for any new course provision in the UK or overseas, A, it needs to stack up, but secondly, there will always be upfront, in, upfront finances needed. So this isn't, you know, you don't set up a, a Cairo course because you have lots of other, other areas. There are specific uh, resources that are needed to deliver chiropractic. So the laws need to be up some front resource. And I think actually one of our other institutions delayed it because of the pandemic, because actually there's, there's challenges and, um, and pressures on the, the upfront finances. Um, and resources it needs it, you know there needs to be space and accommodation realistically there'll be i'm sure opportunities for for uh, placements outside but but there will need to be some sort of on-site clinic facility um, again it's really making a special case for that as a, as a source of income potential and i think that's an income generation which is is actually very valued community support community outreach you know lots of uh, good good work that i think lots of great case studies that can be made around that um, so, but um, what university executives loves are some great metrics, um, and this is what the government loves too. So, you know, highly professional, highly employable, uh, you know, very, very, you know, do a chiropractic degree, starting salary is one of the highest you can get, uh, entry tariffs pretty high. So there are really, really massive benefits at a strategic level uh, for, for drawing chiropractic into institutions. Diversity we have challenges with. Again, with the professions help, I think we're we're working on that a lot, but um, something that we need to keep keep moving forwards. Um, and then we want some excellent researchers. Um, and again, I think you know, as I've mentioned before, in a university base, we are very well placed to support that uh, and provide scholarships. Actually, really drive some some really high quality research and make sure that's being shared internationally. Um, so it ain't easy. There's lots of challenge, but I feel very positive, um, you know, being involved with the profession. I think there's so much to offer. I think there's a couple of areas that I think if we all work together to help unlock, then things could move very quickly because this is a really good time to make sure that uh, people get the benefits. Everyone needs the benefit of, of very good care and uh, probably now more than ever. So, uh, so I sort of, I suppose it's a, you know, let's lead the way through through fantastic education and, and let's support the profession as much as we can. So um, thank you very much. I hope that uh, gives a bit of a, an overview, but thank you very much for your time. Hello and welcome back everybody. Um, so uh, our next speaker, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Giles Hazan, and uh, Giles is a, uh, a GP uh, down in my neck of the woods in Sussex, and um, as a profession, we've perhaps, uh, as we've been hearing, been too isolationist, and if we're to offer our services to uh, a wider socioeconomic group, then this has got to change, and we can't do this alone. And uh, uh, Giles has extensive experience working in multidisciplinary teams, uh, and he's got a special interest in musculoskeletal health care. Uh, he was the vice president of the British Institute of Musculoskeletal Medicine and now sits on the education board of the British Association of Sports and Exercise Medicine as a lead in MSK. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Giles um, uh, to take us through uh, his insights into working in multidisciplinary teams. Giles. Thank you very much, Matthew. I'm going to attempt to share the screen. So let me get this 
Thank you very much all for inviting me uh, to be with you today. Um, really fascinating to hear the presentations to date and I hope I will be able to add um, my perspective to this. Um, so a little bit of background about me. Um, as Matthew said, I'm a GP and I work in Sussex uh, where I'm currently working as a salary GP, but I also work two days a week in the community pain clinic locally. Um, and I, I got a number of roles as mentioned before working with the BASM Education Committee uh, and I'm involved. Education has been a a massive part of my life really ever since I was uh, 18 and I had uh, the pleasure of teaching um, uh, air stewardesses how to speak English in China for a year which was every bit as good as it sounds um, and since then I've worked uh, working with postgrads and undergrads um, the local medical school in Brighton um, and a few others um, and really interested in uh, interprofessional education so I've worked with um, organizations like Red Whale who deliver a lot of postgrad education for GPs and AHPs um, and then more recently in the last year or two working with the muscular skeletal association of chartered physiotherapies uh, physiotherapists or the macp um, delivering a few courses for them as well um, very much involved in supporting and the developing the newer inter uh, professional roles including first contact practitioners and advanced practitioners and really i'm here today to share a little bit of my experience um, as a commissioner as a clinician and an educator and the commissioning bit comes from essentially from around 2011 when I worked um, for what was then the primary care trust and then evolved into the CCGs um, as an MSK commissioner and this was in the south coast area where we we had uh, although we were quite a small ccg um about 22 practices um we had a, a much greater spend on musculoskeletal um uh, interventions than the rest of the population we had a very fragmented set of um services and, and huge variation in practice so we Commission. We designed uh, uh, an integrated community MSK service, and we're involved in commissioning uh, the group that's now um, running this, which is the Sussex MSK Partnership, um, which is a, a not-for-profit partnership. Um, and then in 2015, I moved from being a commissioner to actually working as a clinician. So having worked as a GP partner for several years, have being a, a practice MSK clinician, um, I, I then evolved into taking the step into working uh, in what was then called a GP with a specialist interest, a gypsy. Um, you can imagine how delighted my mother was when I told her I was becoming a gypsy. Um, and, and it's really from there since 2015, I've worked more clinically and then more as an educator and, and have stepped away from the commissioning role, um, but have worked in, in clinics as, a, in a, as an advanced practitioner. Um, so I ended up going through the same competencies and accreditation as my physiotherapy colleagues did. And as, as Leslie mentioned, working alongside the MDT, which would include obviously physiotherapists, but we've also had a number of osteopaths that work with us in Sussex MSK Central in Brighton. Um, and was was you you know quite quite i suppose a bit of a pathfinder in 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 the kind of national scheme of things in the you know my my uh, clinical lead was a physiotherapist one of my supervisors was an osteopath who's now moved on to become the clinical director of the msk service in camden so you know quite a useful bit of experience but i think we're probably all aware that our experiences will vary enormously in terms of you know the, these phrases that roll off the tongue of working in you know an MDT setting it all sounds great doesn't it um but I think probably our, our individual experiences of working in MDTs has been very different and I, I, I think a lot of people will claim they have good N MDTs set up and actually what you've got is a number of different clinicians broadly working under the same roof, but essentially working in isolation, bouncing a patient between them. And that's not really what we're looking for, is it? And, and even the, the, the phrase multidisciplinary team, I think is probably going out of fashion. And as Leslie mentioned, probably more in favor looking at interdisciplinary or multi-professional working. 
which is all very kind of NHS speak, isn't it? And you'll have to forgive me for, for using it. But, but what's the principle behind the MDT? Well, we hear a lot about patient-centred care, don't we? And again, it's a, it's a good buzz phrase, but it can be rather meaningless in the way it's applied. But our MDTs should be working to provide that multi-professional opinion sitting around the patient and moving from the traditional linear pathway of care of you know try a and if a doesn't work go to b go to c you know and ending up in in this sort of vortex of despair of a patient bouncing between all these different opinions and professions rather than getting the individual to the right care uh, right from the beginning so we have a number of roles in the MDT, and it's not just about providing clinical expertise, where of course that's 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 vital, but it is about working in integrated care pathways. It's about providing support and advocacy for the individual who's trying to navigate their way through this rather complex um, pathway. And as has previously been alluded to, it's about pathway and uh, uh, clinical care and uh, quality improvement. So this is about audit, it's about monitoring, it's about outcome measures and really adding to the way we can evolve patient care. And I'm very lucky where I work, I've got this, this great collection of clinicians around me. So I now I moved from working in the sort of Brighton MSK service now to the Eastbourne MSK service where it's very similar setup. But I work in an MDT where I'm the only doctor. We've got three psychologists, specialist pain psychologists. We've got uh, three specialist pain physiotherapists and an occupational therapist, uh, all working as a, as a team. We have a weekly MDT meeting where we discuss cases as well as plenty of opportunities to learn and develop together, which is sadly quite unique. You know, this is not your standard pain service out there. So it will exist in pockets, but by no means is this universal. But it does give us the opportunity to have this great uh, uh, sharing of information, of ideas. The clinical lead is a psychologist, not me. It's, it's you know, this, I think the tradition of the, the doctor in the room being automatically the, the, the taking a leadership role is long gone, I'm delighted to say. Um, and of course, we run a range of different uh, uh, programs, pain management programs, as well as liaising closely with then secondary and tertiary care in terms of um, other specialities, um, including interventional approaches as well. The origins of this, it's worth recognising where does this all come from? And this dates back to my kind of commissioning days, is recognising that the publication from the Department of Health of this musculoskeletal services framework in 2006 is what formed the basis of the change. And it recognised all of those points that I talked about that were relevant to us locally, variation in care, fractured services, lots of waste, um, and, and variating, uh, sorry, var a variety of quality of outcomes as well. So, so what they recommended in that was trying to change the system to this much more multidisciplinary setup with the, the evolution and inclusion of clinicians working in advanced roles. Under, underpinned by things like shared decision making, by patient reported outcome measures. This was really shifting to try and give the patient voice more, uh, more relevance and, and uh, more emphasis. Lots about the systems that sit behind that. So that has to be facilitated by really good IT, really good communications and developing more into the role of self-care and management. And I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you that the new NICE guidelines on, on chronic primary pain really emphasize that shift into uh, the, the, the dominance of, of self-management. And, and there's been a lot that's informed that, but not least the NHS long-term plan, which, which really identified the need to change the workforce and enhance it, expanding the MDTs and looking at clinicians working outside of their and perhaps initial or original scope of practice. Um, and and the, the, 
the the NHS long term plan sits alongside then there's a 10 point plan for general practice. So in particular, primary care will, has been suffering, um, funnily enough, the 5000 doctors that we were promised um, a few years ago by Jeremy Hunt never quite materialized. Um, it will stagger you to, to hear that politicians promises fell short of reality. But we are, of course, trying to make up for that. And, and part of that is looking at how we can improve recruitment and retention. How can we encourage allied health professionals into primary care um, and the GP contract that came out in 2019-20 um, identified these additional roles all requiring advanced practice skills and that includes physiotherapists but also occupational therapists, dietitians, podiatrists and paramedics. So we've seen this this growth of other clinicians working in primary care and the training up to that advanced practice level is something that it's sort of a, it's felt to me a little bit like the boat's been pushed out to sea whilst it's still being built because we've got a lot of clinicians working in these areas but actually for, for a lot of us and that I'd include myself working as a GP with an extended role or a, a GP with a specialist interest um, previously we've not really had any standardized frameworks we've not had a single point where we could go to say this is what defines your ability to work in that role so there's been a lot of variation in in, in the, the quality of clinicians working in these environments in a way which we really needed to address and it's been a priority for, for the physiotherapists working in these advanced roles um, and equally it's something that I've been championing and trying to develop for GPs working in extended roles as well. So what does that mean in terms of the, the accreditation and training? Well you will, you will no doubt many of you be familiar with, with the new framework that's come out. And there have been lots of frameworks out there. And certainly when I was researching this for, for GP uh, training and developments, there are numerous frameworks out there. There's certainly not a lack of, of prior research. And, and as Leslie mentioned, the evidence that's already out there. But the, the new multi-professional framework that has been developed by Health Education England gives us an agreed definition and it, it nicely sets out that what, what they refer to as the capabilities really are the competencies of what is required to work at advanced practice and then it goes on to lay out your, your pathways to practice and this is so important because I think from an employer's perspective there's always been the lack of clarity of, of what defines somebody as having the competency for the role so locally for us in in Sussex we had I mean, it's a very well run organization. So we were fortunate that they had developed a competency framework already that we had to work through, but that was not necessarily universal. And, and as has been alluded to already, there are many frameworks that have been drawn on. And, and these are the key ones really. And, and the IFOMT uh, uh, framework provides probably the international standard of, of competencies. But then that's evolved in terms of the musculoskeletal core capabilities framework, which was then subsequently developed. And all of that, these all sit in this, this neat Venn diagram, as, I, as I've, I've put up there. And really, this is all about trying to identify the what they've then gone on to define real boil down to those those competencies which are put in within the knowledge skills and attributes so the ksa these are the core bits that one would need to be aware of and meet to prove uh, capacity um, and so this has come out from the center of advanced practice and what they've what they've suggested is that from april of this year and of course things have fluctuated with um with covid but clinicians have been required to show that they've either started gathering a portfolio of evidence to prove competency um, or they're, they're working on a pathway towards that. There are different training routes that I'll expand on shortly. And the emphasis really is that what they've described, this, this knowledge, skills and attributes, defines the capabilities required to be safe and competent in musculoskeletal practice. Um, and, and those, uh, so that sits within the, the, the MSK core capabilities framework. And that was, um, so that was published in 2018. And that was informed by quite a few different groups. So that was 
um, NHS England, Health Education England, Public Health, and then the um, Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Alliance, ARMA, which I think um, some of you may well be familiar with as well. So within that KSA framework, what do they talk about? Well, they, they've laid out these different domains, different areas of practice, um, as, as shown in that slide. So it, it's quite a broad scope of practice. And I think from a chiropractic perspective, um, I guess that's where it starts to be, starts to raise the question is how does your, you know, how does the existing chiropractic training and, and the, the qualifications through from the health education institutions map across to this and where are the gaps, you know, because that's really what's, what, what's been happening in physiotherapy and equally from a, from the, the GP's perspective is that we're looking at these these frameworks as being the sort of gold standard and I think now that that's all gone through and been ratified by Health Education England these are the standards to meet for all of us so we because we're coming at them from so many different routes in whether you're a paramedic a GP a physiotherapist an osteopath and hopefully in the future a chiropractor you would need to see how where the gaps are and, and what are the routes to either retrospectively uh, accredit what you've what you've done or prospectively then attend the right courses or add in to complement what you've done already. Um, the, the appropriate level of clinical practice, safety, governance, all of these things are, are sort of kept within that. Um, but the, the programs are all, um, all of the routes through to practice involved involve a period of, of mentored clinical practice um, and clinical examination. So the, the, this is essentially going to be a combination of approaches and there is no one single uh, qualification or piece of evidence that provides in itself um, proof of competency. It tends to be about gathering multiple points and it's what is an education, it's about triangulation, it's about providing lots of different bits of evidence to prove competency. The key bit that come, keeps on coming up in all of these documents is what they talk about, the four pillars of practice. And the the definition of, of advanced practice that I'm going to come on to describes working to master's level. So what they describe as level seven in, um, in the framework I'll touch on in a minute um, across all four of these pillars. And I think that's probably quite a key thing to be aware of is that it may well be that the clinical areas are covered education, but what, you know, the covering the, the, the pillars of research, leadership and management form an essential part of this. And, and that's an area which, I have to say, looking at the document, it, it, it's not too onerous to fulfil those requirements, but there is there is a need to provide the relevant evidence. All of this leads you on to being able to show that you can work at that advanced level. So there's the definition of advanced practice, which really identifies the fact that you're working as an autonomous practitioner, you're able to manage complex cases um, and that you're covering those four pillars of practice. But you would need as, so any of these allied health professional roles are required to have a minimum of working at level seven clinically before you start working into practice. So the framework talks about a stage one, and a stage two of the, the working towards your first contact practitioner qualification. The stage one is meeting all of these requirements, the knowledge, skills and attributes, um, and working at level seven across the four pillars before you then work in a primary care setting. Just to, to emphasize the, the what are all these level sevens and so on, and, and it can get very complex, all the terminology, but this is essentially identifying that you're working at the, the UK academic master's level um, and, and outlines those different areas of practice that one would, one would work to. So again, a lot of this stuff is stuff that I think we probably all think we would work at. It's just about how you evidence that. Um, clinicians going into these roles will potentially be coming from a range of different backgrounds and I think that's the other thing to point out is that you've it's it's going to be uh, significantly easier to, to navigate this process if you're starting out in your career and then you're looking at okay I can just go through to one of the health education institutions that gives me the relevant qualifications fantastic but we recognize of course that that 
that's not true for everybody and for all of us that are already working in these uh, settings how do we retrospectively gather the right amount of evidence so they've recognized that within this framework and what they've they've put together are these different routes essentially the the the, the classic sort of early early career route would be on the right hand side you're going through a taught master's uh, level uh, qualification through uh, a university course, including the relevant first contact practitioner modules. And there are loads, I mean, Leslie will know better than me, there will be a bunch of different um, health education institutions providing additional qualifications, additional FCP modules to their courses now. And there's a whole range of different approaches out there. So it's, I, I was on a, a webinar the other day with, with um, a representative from the University of Lancashire where they do it, they have an interesting scheme where they will ratify and accredit other training that's done before. So I thought that was an interesting route through. People coming in with a variety of evidence before, can, it can be presented um, and then scrutinized and then accredited through one of these uh, universities, which uh, is an interesting approach. And I guess that might be where that we're leaning more into that blended route of doing both um, uh, modules or relevant training courses alongside your portfolio of evidence. The portfolio route is in many ways what, what, what a lot of us would be doing that are already working in these settings is scrabbling around, gathering all the evidence and getting suitable sign off to make sure that we've met the competencies um, to say that we've got the relevant accreditation and competencies in place. From a physio perspective, what does that look like in reality? Well, most people, you know, the physios will come out with their initial degree, um, will then need to be working up to that master's level um, and, and will have the relevant accreditation with the CSP um, and then that that uh, uh, supervised, uh, a supervised a supervisor's letter confirming their experience. The evidencing of their MSK training will include these potential postgraduate courses. So, so the courses that I run for the MACP, I do one on demystifying blood tests in MSK practice, and I've got another one about uh, medication, uh, the role of medication in pain, which is limited, isn't it? Um, but uh, there's there's a range of ways in which people will then be able to gather that portfolio of evidence, um, and it's it's very similar. I have to say, what what was interesting when I was reading about this is that this is essentially borrowed from the GP training approach so as a GP going through our training for each of our job roles that we were doing in training we had to amass a load of evidence meeting a, a you know meeting a set of competencies and referencing which competency was signed off by which activity using these workplace-based assessments so observed skills patient feedback case-based discussions a whole range of different pieces of evidence all amassed into one place signed off by your supervisor and then there's your body of evidence so the, the evidence gathering is something which will be more familiar to some of you than others, um, but that, that knowledge, skills and attributes document really is the core of that. What about supervision? I mean, the role of supervision in this, and it's it's an interesting one, and, and to, to come back to Leslie's point about interprofessional working, there is a, there are, they are currently evolving primary care training hubs, and these are essentially an evolution of the existing primary care education groups. So that that that's informed by things like GP deaneries. But the the principle is that we're we're looking to create uh, processes and organisations that can can facilitate interprofessional education. So. I absolutely could not agree more with Leslie that the, the key to this is those that, that will learn together will work together really well. You know, you're establishing those relationships right from the start. And the process of supervision and onwards governance around the role um, is, is the other aspect of this to be aware of is that the continuing professional development requires us to continue 
presenting evidence, continue adding to the portfolio. Um, and so my in my current job role in the pain clinic, I have three levels of supervision. So I've got peer supervision where we'll sit in with each other, we'll have conversations, we'll sit on, on clinics and so on. I've got managerial supervision, um, and that's more about the development of the role and, and all the kind of research audit quality improvement stuff. And then professional supervision where I've got uh, a consultant who's a mentor to me who I will have regular meetings with to cover things like case discussions, um, but also help identify areas, educational needs for me um, and, and provide that level of supervision uh, for my practice. And just to give you an insight into this, so this was the supervised practice that I followed when I first started working as a GP with an extended role. So the, these different levels of supervised practice um, that you would pass through as you gained confidence experience and you would be signed off by your clinical supervisor as you met each level up to the point where you're able to work as an autonomous practitioner. So that's the sort of approach you would likely see in practice within uh, an NHS setting. And that annual CPD appraisal route that I mentioned, uh, this is this is fairly standard, and this is what what I uh, I was working to and continue is is you're expected to produce cases every year. You'd have a, a peer review session. Um, for us, we in when I was working in Brighton in the spine clinic, particularly, obviously when we're we, we're ordering MRI scans, interpreting and, and directing treatment on the basis uh, of them. We, you know, we were it was important that we had we had regular sessions with one of the, the musculoskeletal radiologists as well, which was very helpful. Um, the, 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 the nature of ongoing training and development is important. So most different pathways locally in the MSK service, the spinal, so it, it's done anatomically, your spine, hip and knee, shoulder and elbow and so on, um, would have a defined CPD program. So we would have an opportunity not just in the MDT to have, have case discussions, um, but we'd have team training days, um, defined uh, CPD sessions. So for NPA stands for new patient assessments. So the clinicians in the pain team that I work in, um, myself and the physiotherapists are the ones that do the new patient assessments, um, as well as the supervision that we've mentioned um, and a load of other kind of local and national training opportunities. With that, it's important then to recognise where, where where are these opportunities for, for growth and development. Um, and, and there is a huge expansion of what's being offered, um, both from local organisations and then national, many of whom you'll be familiar with already, um, as well as then, as I mentioned, there are people like Versus Arthritis and Red Whale, who are, who are organisations that I work with to, to deliver training and education as well. And of course, your, organ your very own organisations uh, doing the same. I wanted to, to briefly touch on some of what I'm working on as a GP, um, because that bears relevance perhaps to the future of interprofessional accreditation and professional development. So as I mentioned, you know, I, I started off um, being called a gypsy and now call myself a GP with an extended role. and and what's the whole point there? Why is that relevant? Well, this is part of the Royal College of GPs recognising the shift away from being somebody with just an interest in an area to actually working formally in a role which is not covered by the normal scope of practice. So this, this is something I put together a while ago. And, and if you think about those four pillars of practice that the physios have, have kind of identified and has now become part of that advanced practitioner role, all of this sits within that. But there's the, I, there was a separate talk I gave a while ago about what, what's our USP? You know, we're all talking about blurring of these traditional boundaries and working across professions. But what we need to do is equally recognize that we each carry into these different settings our own unique skill sets and as a gp you know the the key thing for me is working i'm working as a uh, what a colleague of mine termed a specialist generalist so 
you can kind of almost go full circle and, and you know you pride yourself on developing these specialist skills and interventions and courses and so on and actually I come back to the core of it for me what's probably the most relevant and useful bit is my training as a GP it's managing multiple comorbidities it's the communication skill set um, it's the the psychosocial elements of the biopsychosocial model that we all work to that are, are covered in name but not in reality a lot and, and this, um, this document from the Royal College sets out these standards and really just emphasizes what we've said already that, that, that the GP cannot carry out these extended roles without having further training. And, and they really recognize them as distinct from standard general practice. So the, the Royal College published this set of standards and that's great, but what we don't have is, is what supports that. So we lacked a formal training route. We lacked any accre formal accreditation um, and we lacked a home. And that's one of the big problems for people working in these extended roles is that, sort of the RCGP by that definition is saying that we, we, you know, we're not really covering you. That's not really, you know, the RCGP's job to, to kind of look after you. So where, where, where's the home for us people working in extended roles? So it's a big project I've been involved in is trying to address this. So, so I've written this, this, this pro draft document about creating the framework, which is all about pathways to practice covering accreditation and the competencies, which, overlaps significantly with what we've talked about already. If we've got this Health Education England approved group, those are the standards, those are the, the competencies that we need to match. Clearly that informs what we're going to have to do as GPs. And we've been working alongside the Faculty of Sports and Exercise Medicine, as well as the British Association of Sports and Exercise Medicine, to develop this extra little nugget role here. So this is the kind of standard training pathway for GPs or those working in sports and exercise medicine where uh, running from left to right you start off qualified as a doctor you then select into what training route you want to do and that might be sports and exercise medicine it might be general practice training it might be internal medicine whatever it is it is um, sorry I should have said the sports and exercise medicine bit comes after your core training and, and this is underpinned uh, on that top level with the black arrow running from left to right. These are the workplace-based assessments that I mentioned. We're doing them right from the get-go and then getting our membership exams, whether that's a membership of the Royal College of GPs or phys uh, physicians or um, uh, emergency medicine. Then you can go on and say, okay, as a GP, we get our certificate, uh, oh, excuse me, certificate of completion of training. Try saying that after a couple of gin and tonics. Um, and that that's what qualifies you to start working as a, as a GP. But at that point, others will go on to carry on into uh, qualify as a sports and exercise medicine consultant or whatever. But we, we really are then looking at additional qualifications and training pathways. And the Faculty of Sports and Exercise Medicine has essentially offered now to accredit that. And I've worked with them and a load of other colleagues to uh, develop a, a, an exam that was launched very recently, which is seen as our entry level knowledge test. So it's it, it's a, a, an applied knowledge test, an MCQ exam, which then will be a doorway into joining this route um, in terms of uh, getting a diplomat membership of the Faculty of Sports and Exercise Medicine. And this is a interprofessional thing. So this is open to all comers, essentially. So we're working at it and we, we've come quite far. We've, we've identified the standards, we've recognised the competencies, we've got our curriculum, uh, we've got the qualification now, we've got an agreed portfolio of evidence, um, and we're beginning to work on these two, on, 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 on getting the right courses recognised, um, ratified and signposted. And then the key... Oh, that's... When does the landline ever uh, ring? Goodness me. Sorry about that. Um, so the, you know, the next stages are developing our interprofessional education routes um, and working with others to, to deliver that joined up work opportunity and training opportunity. And that's really the, the kind of the bit at the end of the rainbow here is improving and enhancing collaborative working. And I firmly believe that that comes from true interprofessional education is at its core. So 
this, you know, we are seeing a seismic shift happening. We are moving away from these traditional hierarchies and focusing more on capabilities, on competencies rather than job roles. So this blurs those traditional boundaries between the specialities um, and it's underpinned and supported by the creation of these nationally recognized standardized routes to accreditation and this emphasis on interdisciplinary rather than multidisciplinary working. So it's a work in progress. We've got more to go. Clearly, you guys are going to have a lot of queries and questions about how chiropractors and chiropractic education can, can align with this. And I wish I could give you some answers to that, but please don't throw things at me. Um, I'm, I'm not on the uh, Health Education England ratification board or anything, but um, I think the future's bright and I think we've got, we've got more to come. So thank you very much for your time and for listening to me. And to whatever extent I possibly can, I will be very happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Giles. That was uh, very enlightening. Um, we've had a series of questions that have come through, um, and I'm gonna try uh, as best I can to encapsulate the uh, messages that are coming through, the questions that are coming through, and try to put it to each of the speakers to get a, a bit of feedback. Um, just as an overall comment, it's quite clear that integrating the learning experience leads to an understanding of each other. Um, that was pointed out by Leslie and has been backed up by the other two speakers. Uh, and that clearly is one good route to cultural competence. I think the linguistic thing that Adrian's doing is fascinating. Um, and it's already clear that there is a huge change in the way things are working. Um, and that will only accelerate. It's not going to slow down. Uh, change is rapid and it's going to get more rapid. Um, and therefore, we need to work within that environment to try to maximise our opportunities as a profession. So on that basis, I'm going to try and get to the nub of, nub of each of your uh, talks and, and, and use the questions that have come in. Um, I'm afraid I can't carry on looking at the questions while I'm doing this, but I will come back to them when they're being when the questions are being answered. But there's one point that's come through, uh, Adrian, really, I suppose, um, the international university links. Um, do you see there's an opportunity for each of the universities to extend the process of getting chiropractic programs into other universities using that link between universities? I mean, most universities have links with other, with other institutions in other countries. And how do you think it would be good for us to try to extend that influence that we have to persuade them so, because one of the big problems is we just don't have enough chiropractors being trained and that's we've uh, isolated as a problem. Uh, so how do we persuade more universities? And um, we've worked hard with um, and we've had some limited success with three institutions here in the UK starting, but we would like to think about how we can do that more internationally. Can you give us any idea on that, on what your thoughts might be? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a very, very individual situation. It varies according to the context. Uh, you know, one of, one of the historical um, issues that we've had here in Spain is that when we have had the opportunity, opportunity to knock on the door, walk through the door and sit down with legislators, you know, they invariably ask us, you know, what's your demographic as a profession within the country? Second question, what research do you have that's local based here in Spain as opposed to international to show uh, effectiveness, scope of practice, the, the types of patients that you attract? And, you know, every time we've done that here in Spain, the, the few times we've had the opportunity to do that here in Spain, we've immediately fallen over ourselves because we're so few to start with. Um, to, to attract the attention of the legislators and look like we're something that could pose part of the solution for them in providing uh, more well-trained primary contact healthcare providers, we, we just don't have it. There, there's not enough of us. You know, even now with two colleges operating here in Spain, there are only about 300 chiropractors for 46 million people, which means when we go to the legislators, we, we just don't. You know, we can't make an argument for being a workforce that can make a difference on a scale that would warrant them bringing into place, going to all the effort of bringing into place legislation related to one specific profession. So, uh, so on that, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but on that basis, if you've got a country like the UK, which has got a, an established regulatory framework, 
We've now got uh, five university-based programs um, working. Do you think there's an opportunity for the UK universities to help influence that argument in countries where there isn't a legislative framework? And I don't know, Leslie, maybe you would have a comment on how much influence you think the university sector in the UK might have on international universities. Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter. I mean, I've been involved in a few, few discussions around some of that. And I think, you know, we obviously in the UK, we are training, you know, we've got 33 different nationalities at ACC, for instance. So we obviously, we are training significant numbers that actually probably return overseas as well. Um, I mean, as, as Adrian said, the difficulty is, is there's an individual context. Um, I think we can, I think what, what we see is when we discuss, when we have conversations with colleagues overseas is that they, um, it's sort of in, in the local uh, universities, it's sort of, they're not, they're not, there's not a natural fit. So do they sit with the, the medics? Well, actually, but they're not medics. Where do they in, actually do they sit with allied health? Well, allied health professionals actually in certain European countries are are so different from they are in the UK. So that's not always a, a fit. But the one thing that is consistent is that we need a champion. Um, and if you've not yes. got anyone, in well, the, I think that's uh, uh, you need you've to get somebody in the country who is prepared to be the champion. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, that, that's helpful, and that, that'll give us some pointers in further discussions, I'm sure. Um, one other thing that's cropped up, um, and it's, it's, again, probably focused towards Adrian, who was talking a little bit about um, the online training um, and how the development of an academic programme can incorporate some online work. Um, and one point that's been brought up is that it's, it's, it's perfectly understandable to educate online with academic subjects. Um, and we've got a lot of experience of that at the moment through uh, what we've gone through in the last 12 months. But there is a problem when you come to the clinical training. And how do you think we can address that? What, do you, what, what are you doing in your institution to try to, to address the problem where that bottleneck occurs for clinical training? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, clinical training you know, by, by nature needs to be hands-on and dealing with that in the present context, both practical class, uh, training of, of the skills, clinical skills, uh, chiropractic techniques and interventions, um, communication skills, I, I, you know, much of that needs to happen face-to-face. -face. We've had to get quite uh, innovative in terms of running face-to-face. -face. We don't believe that those things can default to the online environment at this point in time, or we haven't been uh, able to... to do that effectively, I don't think. And so we continue to have face-to-face -face in terms of clinical skills, classroom, clinic time, but we do it in bubble groups. So now, whereas previously we would have, you know, um, half the class, if there are 30 people in a class, then we would have half with a instructor and a, an assistant in, in, in doing the prac components uh, related to, to description in a theoretical online context, then we would bring in small bubble groups that would have uh, more concentrated time with the, the instructor. And we have to protect and guard those bubble groups from, um, from one another in order so that we can track exposures and things like that and work backwards if we run into trouble. Uh, so getting innovative, I think, you know, bubble groups is one way to do that. Uh, using where possible uh, demonstration and getting good at demonstrating and providing podcasts and things online is, can, can certainly support those things. But the present context requires, I think, that we still do certain elements of the program. You know, any, anything that would tr traditionally be done in a classroom where people are sitting in front of or in the presence of a, 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 a a presenter or a facilitator, uh, I think, you know, there, there's scope for that to move to the online. But again, yeah. when you're talking about hands-on skills, we still need to be face-to-face. -face. They need to have that guidance. And uh, we've, we've had to be very innovative. Unfortunately, when you've got small bubble groups, it means you have to have, uh, you know, more time. The instructor's load is greater because you're repeating the same material with smaller groups of people. Our costs go up it puts a stress on the teaching staff, the administration and the finances of the institution for sure. Yeah, okay, well, I'd like to sort of transfer this point to you, Leslie, because one of the options, of course, is placements um, and looking at how, A, uh, students may get some clinical experience in, in placements in, 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 uh, out in practice somewhere, but also how would you then think about evaluating? How do you make sure that the placements are properly evaluated so that the quality of 
um, experience is sufficiently high? Well, I mean, there are very, very well established quality assurance frameworks for placement education um, that have been running outside of the NHS system for, for many, many years. So whether that's, you know, occupational therapy or physiotherapy in community settings, um, where you've got practitioners that aren't traditionally faculty, as it were. So I think, you know, I, I think it's not, I don't think it's, would need again, I don't think it's about reinventing a wheel. I think it's actually about modifying some of the practice that's very well established, very well accepted, has been incredibly, you know, um, successful. Um, but actually what it's allowed to happen is actually exposure to other contexts. I, th I think there are, there are bigger issues of working in private practice settings across um, and actually what, what we perceive that students should be allowed to do in a, an income generating setting. But again, that's not new. That's been happening in across other professions for many years. And, and in the wave of post pandemic Britain, some of the, even the medical training and the, eight, the other allied health training has been taken up by private providers anyway, because it's had to be. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, to go on to your presentation, you talked about um, the legal barriers towards recognition. And of course, a lot of what Giles was talking about was access and how we get to a state where the reputational um, the reputation of the chiropractic profession is such that it gets considered. And I've got a few questions that have come through for Giles later, but do you think the educators, do you think the universities have, could exercise more leverage um, with regard to the um, legal barriers? In other words, to start to address that more. Um, we as a profession have been trying quite hard to do that, but is there, an, is there a role for the educators to help in that? Um, I mean, it's difficult because they are, they are, professional arguments to a certain extent and I think we are um, as as institutions I suppose what's our legal argument in that our legal, our legal argument is opportunity for graduates but that's a professional argument I think I mean I, I think overall I think we can stand shoulder to shoulder with the profession and demonstrate prowess and and I guess rebuff some of the scope arguments or some of the the, the levelness um, but I think you know and you could you could say for instance the the FCP you know, ability of, of some groups to be supported, like to deliver first contact practice in GP settings that are absolutely funded for some professional groups and not others. Is that a, a restriction of trade, for instance? I, I don't know. Well, maybe. Um, I mean, one of the questions that came up actually is, is chiropractic still on the list for SCPs? Uh, the, the, there is a thought that it was actually removed from the list in 2020. So, um, you know, I, I don't know what the situation is. I'm not up to speed on that. Do you know anything about that or not? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the chiropractors and physios and osteos and, you know, can, can all be employed as FCPs. The difference that happened with the new GP contract was that actually GPs surgeries can get funding directly for physios and others now to, for, to provide that role. So I, they're not going to look, I, you know, generally speaking, they're not going to look for to fund Kairos, when actually they can get paid for roles provided by physiotherapy and increasing paramedics and and etc. Um, I think there was a query that came up in the in the, the train about actually that the osteos are in that, but no, that they're not. Osteos are not part of the GP contract yet. Right. If they are, then that could be a bit of a game changer for osteos. Hmm. So, Giles, to come to you, there's been one question from one of our. Uh, one, one of the chiropractic, uh, one chiropractor who is work has worked as an FCP for two and a half years, and they're wondering how they can get their portfolio signed off. I don't know whether you've got any comments on uh, that, that. That's a very specific case, but uh, what is the situation um, when working as an FCP? Well, I, I mean, I'd certainly I wouldn't hesitate to recommend looking at the roadmap to practice if you haven't already. It's freely downloadable and, and available and probably familiarizing yourself with the Center for Advancing Practice as the organization which is relevant um, around the country. There are lots of people currently being trained up to be um, uh, trainers, assessors for the portfolio. So there's quite a few different courses being run to churn people out so they can do that. So I think it's probably worth finding out local to you what the situation is, whether there's any local people who have gone through the relevant training. Um, so I, yeah, probably start with the Center for Advancing Practice and see if they can then signpost you towards relevant local assessors would be my advice. 
Thank you. Um, how seriously do you think your colleagues would take the chiropractic profession um, when applying to be part of a multidisciplinary team? Um, what, what are the drivers that we as a profession should be employing to try to get into that um, network? Yeah, uh, it's interesting because it's it's I don't think it's unique to the chiropractic profession but credibility is always something that comes up you know the shift even going back to you know 2011 when we started to see extended scope practitioners you know they were roundly by the majority dismissed as not having you know the credibility or the experience to be able to take on what were traditionally doctors roles so there is a lot of of negativity still out there um and i think a lot of it's born from ignorance sadly i think what you'll find is once you've worked alongside clinicians of varying different specialities uh you realize you know i most of my msk education has come from the physiotherapy field not from the, the traditional medical field so um you know i i think I think it is a massive barrier to get over will be the perception of lack of credibility in these roles. Um, I think it was really inter it's been really interesting working, uh, working alongside osteopaths um, in the local service. And you realize it's, it's, you know, it's just a label. It's just a name. Individually, you're going to have people who will be incredibly competent, but as with any profession, you will have, people on either end you'll have excellent clinicians you'll have those that don't practice consistently that may not practice along guidelines um and i guess that's one of the issues is the perception barrier um but i guess as with any profession within chiropractic medicine there are some practices which perhaps don't align very well to what is now seen as the orthodoxy um so it's how you how you manage that so you know there's a pr exercise here as much as anything else yeah. Um, do, do you think that the AHP status would be um, critical in, 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 in improving that? I mean, how, how we, we had alluded to that several times in the talk. Yeah. Is, it, is it something which is vital, do you think? Not necessarily. I mean, I think it's that's. I mean, obviously, it rather looks vital from a bureaucratic perspective, but that so, yes, that's an important point. But it would then have to sit alongside local Exam I mean, the classic thing for me is, is is just showing local examples of how that's worked well. And once you've got somebody working either in a practice, you know, we were very concerned about paramedics coming in and working in practice and physicians assistants and FCPs. And what you realize is, and there was a lot of negativity from, from certain areas of general practice about first contact practitioners. And of course, once you start seeing first contact practitioners working and particularly within their scope of practice. That's what I think is really strong for the, the physios working is, is the physios are better qualified than most GPs are to manage most, you know, primary care musculoskeletal stuff. Um, so it's really about setting up examples of good practice and then championing them. And that's, you know, that's how the FCP thing evolved. They had a few pilots that showed uh, and it sh you know, were able to evidence reduction in referrals and, you know, good quality outcomes. So it's that sort of thing, which is, is really helpful to change, change the discussion. A little. So Leslie, on, on that basis, what sort of integration of these sort of things are happening within the undergraduate thing? So that, for instance, looking at uh, the guidelines that are out there, NICE's recommendations, et cetera, how much of that is part of the undergraduate training that uh, students may be exposed to? Well, I think one of the things, because we've you know, just revalidated the new M Cairo, for instance, and I know that I had a long chat with uh, the head of school before it happened to sort of try and, it's really about what we, what we map to actually. So you can look at, I mean, nice guidance, that's just evidence base that, that should be used to, across the curriculum. So the scholarly activity or the research evidence that underpins the curriculum. But actually the IFOMT guidance we were aware of and, for, and that is such a key part of the FCP portfolio that um, the, the discussion that I had with uh, the, the head of school was to make sure that we did map to that as part of the curriculum development. Yeah, of course, we've mapped to plenty of Cairo documents, but actually let's <laughs> make sure we're mapping to things that actually in due course, when the graduates come out, we can actually, we are able to say, yes, the curriculum itself has already mapped to this. They're not working at master's level. They're not crafting, you know, and I've, we've had this discussion with, who Giles will know, Amanda Hensman-Cook, who's the FCP, done a lot of work with FCP development. Um, 
So the, an undergraduate master's is not sufficient to demonstrate master's level study on the, within the pillars. Um, but actually, if we can make sure that the curricula that we are teaching map to the key guidance documents to allow, I mean, many, many students as they graduate may not want to go into any of these roles. That's absolutely fine. But it just in case they do, it means that there's a better opportunity to then take people into more of the SCPs to carry out the, the pilots. Um, because, I, you know, I think um, with the best will in the world, people that have been graduated for a long time won't necessarily have the awareness. How would they, how would they have kept up with all of this? It's, it's so that hard. If you're in it, it's hard to keep up with it. <laughs> so, and that's what some of the training is about. It's about filling the gaps, the, the, the sort of modules and some of the, the uh, and that's the sort of, we're actually looking at developing quite a lot of that at the moment ourselves. And of course, there is an issue with different uh, environments. So the Spanish situation is different to the UK situation, and I accept all that. Um, Adrian, you referred to in your talk, um, the chiropractic in society module uh, that you run. Uh, and does this include a means of understanding and addressing MSK health in a qualities in the population um, and um, we've talked about integration within the profession but also we need to extend the scope of chiropractic care to the patient to a wider patient base it's still quite limited in the people who have access to it does your module do that yeah a lot of what we look at there takes into consideration the the frame of reference offered by the biopsychosocial model so, you know, they do a year of psychology looking specifically at how psychology relates to um, evaluating people with neuromusculoskeletal problems, uh, you know, utilizing some of the proms. We make strong use of patient reported outcome measures uh, and, and ensure that students know how to administer those and how to score those um, many and diverse and you know, very, very well researched now patient reported outcome measures that have very good validity, reliability and responsiveness. Uh, so that's part of the clinical package that we offer. We also very, very much attempt to ensure that students are aware of practice guidelines, aware of NICE and other, other you know, national consensus based guidelines, but we are very, very, um, you know, structured with each new patient and each re-examination is the requirement that students formulate an answerable question that they then uh, convert that into keywords that they, that they essentially then take it to an appropriate um, uh, electronic database or databases, search that, detail their search strategy, then look at and interpret the best available evidence and then apply that to the individual patient, reflect on that, the steps of the evidence-based approach. So, you know, we're very, very keen, given how complicated and, uh, and the amount that's involved in teaching students to be proficient at the evidence-based approach, not to have them default to uh, practice guidelines, uh, but to know that they exist and to consider the results that they get when they go through that evidence-based approach themselves uh, but our, our frame of reference, to get back to your question, I guess, is, is more the biopsychosocial model. Um, we look at patient-centered care, shared decision-making, and uh, make sure that, as mentioned, they have a way of evaluating patients coming into care and then to apply those um, objective and, and well-researched patient-reported outcome measures at re-examination to show progression or lack thereof in, and to use that in their decision-making, shared decision-making in determining where the care goes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and lastly to you, Giles, um, just, just looking at the development of these, and, and I accept what Leslie says, that not everybody graduating is going to want to go in to that form of work, but it, it's a very interesting avenue for graduates to look at, or people who've been in practice for a while and want to change in role, similar to the, the, the way you have changed your professional role. Um, so as far as that's concerned, um, do you think this is something which will develop regionally and therefore experience in one region will influence decisions elsewhere? Or is there a more mileage in doing a nationally coordinated strategy for it? Oh, it's interesting. I, th I think you, you need to do both, actually. Um, I think there's a lot of value in... Um, <sighs> Yes, I mean, as, as I am with the GP pathway, I'm trying to work on a national level to make sure we get something that is standardised across the country. Um, however, I think one of the problems is that you'll often find that whilst waiting for a national approach to develop and be delivered, 
you can be waiting a very long time. And actually, there's a lot to be said for growing something organically. And traditionally, for GPs in my sort of role, we've had to go out and it's all about who you know, not as much as what you know. Um, so I would encourage people to explore local links, develop those relationships, because that can then add to the, the kind of reputational and evidence base that will then drive the national picture. So I think it has to be you know, top down and bottom up approaches rather than rather than one excluding the other. OK, and the final question for you, Leslie, do you know if there have been any studies undertaken in the UK to identify expectations of competencies, skills and behaviours for the profession, um, you know, as in, in within the context of integrating in the wider medical field? Um, do you teach the validation requirements and, uh, and then take that on to how graduates can integrate in an interprofessional framework? Um, I'm not sure if there's been many studies done. There's been lots of recommendations that come out of Charlotte Le Bouvide and others that have written about how, how chiropractic might frame itself in that wider environment. And a lot of that is actually, you know, it's not about diluting chiropractic. It is about demonstrating how it has a shared purpose with other healthcare professions and being able to articulate that. Mm -hmm. So that, it, you know, while, well, well, very, very like Giles says, actually it's sort of, you know, the, the sort of thing of a, a specialist generalist of um, rather than everyone, you know, the, the kind of classic um, descriptor is the fact is a bit sort of like eggs. And actually, you know, rather than having scrambled egg and everybody doing the same job that with different titles, actually there's lots of, you know, poached eggs sitting on a, on a piece of paper where everyone is bringing something to the table that's different, but with a common theme. And I think rather than demonstrating, you know, ongoing difference, it's actually about demonstrating why it has its own unique identity, but actually is sharing the common cause about improving population health, but has really something to bring to the table. And I think that that's what we're trying to shape very, very carefully. Um, just coming back to Giles's point, you know, I think I think it does actually need some 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 designated pilots for FCP and it's not looking about satisfaction or whether equivalent satisfaction to GPs it's actually is looking about the outcomes that's how physio managed to, to get that through of, of looking at the really savings that were made for every how many pounds spent on a physio it was saving this to the you know it's that sort of financial modeling um, and I know that Jonathan Field and others have been working really hard to try and drive some of that work forwards but it's got to be the right patient outcomes that are measured for it to have relevance as well. All I can say is um, I, I think it's changed hugely since uh, I was a student in the 1980s and um, I'm very, very impressed at the work that's been done um, and I'm looking forward to seeing um, how the change in the undergraduate experience is going to continue to accelerate and, and I hope that more and more of our colleagues can link up with the multidisciplinary teams that Charles has been talking about because I think that adds another tier of experience for the profession uh, and ultimately the whole idea is to try to address this huge problem of uh, musculoskeletal pain, um, particularly lower back pain, which is uh, at epidemic proportions. I'm going to hand back to Satchit now to round off, but thank you very much to the three of you for your contributions. And I'd also like to thank all of those people, uh, of the participants who've contributed. I've tried to encapsulate your questions as well as I can, but it's quite difficult to keep up when they keep on rushing in and I'm talking and listening and trying to coordinate it all. So I hope I've got all your points together. If there's anything that you would like to specifically follow up with us, please get in touch. So thank you very much and Satchit, over to you. Actually, I'm going to uh, uh, pick up from here, Peter, if, if you don't mind. Um, so, <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, first of all, um, uh, thank you to, to all our speakers. And um, wow, it certainly uh, seems like we've got our work cut out as a profession and uh, individually. Um, and uh, uh, I'm glad, Leslie, that you said it was hard to keep up because I've certainly found it hard to keep up. I think if you find it hard too, that's, that's uh, uh, somewhat heartening to keep up with all these changes. Um, Adrian, thanks very much for, for your presentation. Um, and again, uh, it, it's hard to train um, undergraduates, but to do it in two languages is quite frankly amazing. Uh, and uh, you talked about cultural competence and how we need to show leadership to uh, solve the problems we face. I couldn't agree more. And Leslie and Giles, your uh, presentations and insights in particular are particularly valuable because you're not chiropractors. You uh, look uh, upon the profession with, with eyes that we can't possess. 
and your insights I, th I thought were particularly useful. Um, Leslie, you, you said you wanted to uh, improve the relevance of chiropractic. I couldn't agree more there too. And words really do matter. And uh, what we call ourselves, the use of mainstream language and importantly, the mainstream frameworks that already exist, absolutely vital. And uh, not least of all, one of the things that we stand for, the importance of university education, absolutely vital too. Giles, I really enjoyed your cartoon. Uh, that, I think, uh, speaks to all clinicians uh, who've worked um, or, or, or come across multidisciplinary teams. And the workforce is changing and it is hard to keep abreast of it. And um, the defining roles and the developing um, capabilities um, have to impact us too if we're going to step up and uh, uh, take on the roles that, that you've, you've outlined. And finally, uh, um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, not just our speakers, but also our sponsors. We couldn't have brought this to you without their support and help, and they really are uh, uh, incredibly valuable. So thank you to, to all of you. Uh, but most of all, I'd like to thank you, the attendees. Um, this is why we do it. Um, your input and the questions uh, has been fantastic. And as I draw to cl uh, close, uh, thank you for attending, and uh, we hope you look forward to the next one as much as we will. Thanks all.